Hello, everyone. I'm Harold Fisher. We have an opportunity right now to talk about a very critical issue at the intersection of work, education, and economic progress. Our guest today is Brandon Busty, Chief Partnership Officer and Global Head of Learn Work Innovation, Kaplan North America. Now, this event is sponsored by the Aries Management Corporation. We would like to thank them for their generous participation. Uh, Mr. Busty, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. I am going to uh, uh, call you Brandon, and you know, we've got so much to, to talk about. I appreciate your time. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to the discussion as well, Harold, and thanks uh, for, for making your time available for this as well. Well, first of all, can you kind of give us the, the Cliff Notes version of how Kaplan is connecting work and adult education and your role in making that happen? Yeah, I mean, most people know Kaplan from test prep, right? Almost 85 years ago now, uh, started in Stanley Kaplan's parents' basement when he started tutoring students for entrance into college. And, you know, the interesting part of that story is that what, what drove Stanley's purpose and mission throughout his life was his own uh, denied career opportunity. You know, he ended up uh, graduating number two in his class uh, from one of the CUNY institutions, applied to medical school multiple places, by all respects, should have gotten into every single one of them, given his academic credentials. But because of Jewish quotas in medical schools at the time, he was denied entrance. And so, you know, his ultimate dream was to become a doctor. That door got shut. And he ended up dedicating his life to helping other people achieve their career goals. And, that, and that's a really important phrase because People think about Kaplan, they think about, oh, I, you know, preparation for college or preparation for graduate school. You know, those have always been important milestones or gateways or doors opened on the path to the ultimate journey for those students, which is to get a good or great job, to have a good or, dare I say, great career. So, so I would argue, you know, our entire 85 year history, we've been part of helping people achieve these ultimate career milestones. Now, more recently, you know, we've been involved in helping people prepare for professional licensure in all kinds of different fields, whether that's lawyers who have to pass the bar exam or nurses uh, for NCLEX, et cetera. We do this across real estate, across cybersecurity. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different examples, financial services designations that people need to achieve as a means to getting a better job and earning more money. Uh, and, you know, give you an example of some of the things that we've we've started working on the last year. Kaplan's now doing all of the uh, career advising for Amazon frontline employees who are eligible for their career choice education benefits program. So it's just a great example of where, you know, the history of our organization has really been in helping people achieve these goals when the stakes are, quite frankly, pretty high. Right. You either pass one of these exams or you don't. Um, you know, you either progress into a new job or you don't. They're pretty blunt metrics that measure uh, outcome. But we're super excited about some of the new examples of that work where, um, you know, it, it's interesting, like it, it, the advising work we're doing, it, it's more relevant than ever. And fundamentally, it's it's human to human advising. That's a really, really full basket. I, I'm impressed by that because I, I was not aware of just the variety of offerings that Kaplan uh, is now participating in. I, I want to talk a little bit about adult education, because as we know, many people can't just stop working and return to school. They have financial obligations, they have families to support, but in the fast paced work world, how can they now continue the highly valuable education they need for success? Well, look, the, to your point there, I, I, you know, I want to start by saying there's nothing easy about working a full time job or even a part time job while pursuing education, whether that's a, an associate's degree, bachelor's degree, a master's degree uh, or, you know, some sort of, you know, boot camp or more intensive short form education. They're not easy things to do. And of course, a lot of working adults in that context are not only working they're managing family dynamics, right? They have children, they have spouses, et cetera. And so there's nothing easy about it. That said, you know, over the last 10, 15 years, and especially an acceleration over the last four or five, 
there are more opportunities available than ever before. It's driven by employers who are investing in education benefits for their employees at a higher rate than we've ever seen in the past. We're seeing a, uh, you know, a surge of, of non-degree short form intensive training that are, that, 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 that's propelling people into high paying family sustaining wage jobs. You think about Google IT certifications, for example, AWS cloud certifications. I mean, the examples go on and on, but these are things that are short of college level education, but are also getting people into uh, very well-paid jobs. And then there's just an increased realization among employers that, that, that they need to continually upskill and reskill employees because of the fast changing nature of what's happening with technology and in the marketplace. And so a lot of us increasingly, in order to remain relevant in our jobs, we kind of have to be on a continual education, training, you know, upskilling, reskilling pathway. And so I'm excited to see a lot of examples of it. You're seeing independent third party uh, organizations entering this training, employers taking more ownership of this, and you're starting to see colleges and universities step up more to offer more of this training, making it more flexible. Um, and you know, you look at the growth of, of online degrees and the ability for people to do online education. They can do it at night, on the weekends, right? I mean, this is this has really enabled the adult learner to to be able to accomplish this in ways that they couldn't have in the past when there were classes only available during the week, you know, during daytime hours. And you know, if you're working. It's just not an option. So I think all of those things are positive trends. And in fact, they're things that, that we, you know, we have to be doing more of given the fast changing nature of how things are moving. I wanted to drill down a little bit more on what you just shared because you obviously mentioned you know, certifications, non-degree educational enhancements. Is there a, a, a movement to more of that as opposed to the boss saying, go ahead and finish your bachelor's if you didn't, or maybe you can get a master's and, and we're going to, to help you with that. Yeah. So, so there's a couple interesting things to note, right? It's, it's, it's actually, it's true that more jobs are now being posted and dropping the bachelor's degree requirement, right? We had a lot of jobs that the truth be told um, probably didn't require a bachelor's degree, but that's what it said on the job description, right? And, and yes, indeed, there are jobs and roles that do require advanced degrees and advanced training. I mean, that, that certainly is, is still true, but there has been an increasing trend around employers dropping that degree requirement. You know, it's a white hot talent market. I mean, even as we sit right now in recessionary times, there's uh, 1.7 jobs open for every person looking for a job in the United States right now, right? So it, it's what some economists have called a, a full employment recession. It's kind of weird stuff, right? But, but you realize that, you know, that's also an example of just this incredible talent shortage that employers have. And it's not just the U.S. It's a global talent shortage. You know, there's, there's jobs open. Uh, that some people just don't want. That's become a new uh, realization coming out of the pandemic that, you know, we assume if there's a job available, someone is interested in filling it. Well, not always the case. There's jobs that people just don't want. And they're basically saying, no, thanks. There's also a whole bunch of jobs that people just simply don't have the training and qualifications for. And so the distance between them and that job is some form of education and training. I think what we're doing is we're getting smarter about what we solve, you know, what we use to solve for that gap. Is it automatically a college degree? People step back, evaluate this, you know, the skills needed for the role. And you can go, well, actually, no, if somebody can do this, this and this, I'm cool if they don't have a degree. Right. And so that's where you're starting to see a real emergence of skills based hiring, you know, demonstrate that you can do the task or the job and you've got the job, or I'll hire you, I'll put you through an intensive short form training. That could be a couple of weeks, it could be a few months, but whatever it is, it's much shorter than the typical you know, bachelor's degree program or even associate's degree program. And so I think we're getting wiser about how we're solving for that gap and not just using you know, what I'll call the blunt instrument of a degree. Now, all that said, right? what's, what's fascinating to me is that at the same time that employers are dropping the number of job descriptions that require a bachelor's degree, many of them are choosing to invest in 
education benefits for their employees. And many of those include the opportunity to get a bachelor's degree or to get an associate's degree. So the work we do with Amazon, for example, their career choice program, there's hundreds of options for Amazon employees to take advantage of. And it ranges from associate's degrees to bachelor's degrees to all kinds of other you know, types of certifications and training. And, and you know, what you realize is that that's a really valuable benefit. It attracts talent to a job. You know, it might not be as a frontline worker, the kind of job you want to have for long. But if you can get your college degree while you're doing that, that's a huge opportunity. And, you know, someone said to me the other day, it's kind of like the commercial version of the GI Bill. And I'd never thought about it that way. But but in many ways, this movement of employers willing to invest in education for their employees, it's not just about upskilling in, in their existing role. It's very much about how do I recruit better talent here? Right. How do I help that talent even in many cases move on to a better job elsewhere? If I do that, you know, I still accomplish the goal of filling a role that was critical to fill. And I help, you know, support somebody's career development along the way. And guess what that does for my brand? That's a pretty that's a pretty good thing. Right. Somebody leaves and says, yeah, well, you know, I left Amazon, but they helped me get my college degree. So uh, so it's really interesting that at the same time, they're they're de-emphasizing bachelor degree requirements in hiring. Uh, many of them are also emphasizing the opportunity to, hey, come here and you can get your degree along the way. You know, ed enhancing education is extremely important, particularly for adult workers. And you, I think you kind of touched on this, but but what about enhancing the skill set? I mean, the book knowledge, yeah. certainly very important. Um, the degree, important. Some say, as you suggested, maybe not as much, but the reality is, is once you get the education, you still have to be able to come back and do the job. And when I say come back from, you know, from that online class or from that week seminar, you still have to have an enhanced skill set. How is that done? What is the role of employers in enhancing the skill set? Yeah, well, look, it, you know, that's very much part of it. You know, I mentioned there's there's an emphasis on skills based hiring. And and, you know, so they're, you know, in the in the process, it's not just an interview. It's actually an assignment. Right. And and you can think about this in simple terms and, you know, in tech related jobs or roles where there's, you know, very technical tasks that can be done. You know, part of the interview process is you actually ask somebody to perform one of those tasks. You're going to hire a software developer. You want to actually see that they can you know, develop in, in that particular language. And so they can give them a project to assign, you know. And so there, there has definitely been a proliferation of skills-based assessments as part of the hiring process. And that's where uh, short-form education and training can be very effective. It's being done in all kinds of different modalities, right? Some things can be done entirely online. Some things are being done hybrid, where it's a mix of that and in-person. And of course, there's still some training and jobs that are that are fully in-person in terms of the either the equipment or the conditions that they need to be in to do that. Uh, but I think that has become a really, you know, it's been a growing emphasis in terms of how employers are, are sorting and identifying and hiring talent. And they're realizing that a lot of the talent that's out there just doesn't have that training. So that's what's driving their investment in either paying for or partially supporting paying for that training for, for people who are coming to the jobs. And in many cases, there's hiring contingent upon, you know, getting this skill or being able to demonstrate this skill. So I get hired first and then, you know, I have to demonstrate later after a training that the company has paid for that I'm capable of doing that. If I don't get across that finish line, obviously it's more of a conditional hire type of situation. So you're seeing all kinds of examples of this across the ecosystem. The good news is it's opening the doors to all kinds of talent that companies haven't traditionally paid much attention to. Um, but it's also, you know, forcing those organizations to think very differently about how they do recruitment, how they do training, right? What kinds of investments they make. And so it's a really exciting time, I think, on all sides for people who are looking for jobs, right? Trying to move up in, uh, in a career or switch careers. There has, never, there has never been a better time to make that happen. That doesn't mean it's not also overwhelming. So on the flip side, one of the things that I've been worried about um, is that you know, we have so many options that we put in front of people. It, it's actually a little bit tricky to kind of understand, OK, should I go down that pathway? Should I get on this pathway? If I do this training, does it really get me into a job that I like? So there's examples of what I call failed success. Somebody 
you know, invest their time and money and training. They complete the program and then they realize, actually, no, that's not what I want to do. Right. So that's where advising uh, and some of the wraparound supports really, really uh, start to provide value. And it's a lot of the, you know, the work that we're doing in support of Amazon. We're helping we're helping those workers identify which career paths really are a best fit for them before they take all that time and effort and energy to head down that path. Right. And, 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 you know, and, and try to get to that end game. So here's the question though, is there a danger of promoting educational benefits and opportunities for employees that you would like to keep <laughs> as a company, but then there's the possibility that giving them the upgraded skill set, the degree or the certifications, you could very well lose that employee. How can companies balance that with you know retaining the the adult worker? Yeah, look, I, one way I'll answer that is, I don't know that employers have a choice on that anymore. I mean, sure, there's always the chance that somebody, you know, and the, and the classic example was always a manager getting their MBA, right? That, that was kind of the, the quintessential example of, oh, well, if they get their MBA, they're going to be hireable, they're going to go off and earn a job, you know, why, why should I invest in their MBA? You also ask the question, well, what do I do if I don't? That's somebody that might leave my company a couple of years earlier than they would have otherwise, because there's another company who's paying for that, right? And so I think right now, you know, th this is the important thing. One of the one of the top aspects that people now value in their job, either the job they have or 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 the jobs they are looking for, is learning, growth, and development. This is the desire of the American workforce. People want to be in jobs where they feel connected to mission and purpose. They want to be in jobs where they're learning and growing and developing. And that doesn't always have to mean getting promoted, getting raises, but that's usually, you know, some of the classic examples of that, but that I'm, I'm learning, right. That I feel like I'm growing in what I'm doing. And, and that's, you know, that's something that's, that's part of the workplace culture and what I do. And so that's where, you know, this investment in education and training, you know, no doubt it helps attract people to the organization. That's the first problem employers have to solve for. If they're not attracting the talent, they're, they're, they're out of the game from the very beginning, right? Then to your point, it's about retention. And then it's a thoughtful consideration of retention into what, right? So, so take frontline, you know, retail jobs. I mean, sure, it'd be great to retain frontline retail workers as long as possible, right? They end up getting better at the job, et cetera. But they're not always jobs that people want to stay in for a long period of time. And, and so, okay, well, what are the other roles within my company that I might be able to promote them into? There may only be a precious few manager roles that people could eventually move into. And so you say, all right, well, the odds that I can actually get somebody into a, uh, a manager role in my company are few and far between. So let's not let that be the holdup. You know, if we can retain them for six months longer or three months longer in one of those frontline um, uh, roles, because we've we've helped support their education journey to get a better job, it ends up working out, right? And so, yeah, that person may leave, they may get a better job elsewhere, but it's it's highly likely, and there have been several studies that have shown this for employers that have tracked it, that keeping those workers even several months longer than they would have otherwise uh, is you know a net benefit to the organization financially. And then I think you have what I, I kind of referenced earlier, this long tail benefit you know, it was uh, McDonald's who for a while was was kind of advertising the best first job in America. Yeah. And, I, and I love that theme, right? Like, yes, they want to promote people up into better roles at McDonald's, but they, they also want to be known as a place where, hey, you can get great work experience, you can get education benefits, and you can propel into other jobs and other places. Well, those are people who may leave McDonald's, but boy, they've got a strong brand, you know, affinity to McDonald's as an employer, in the long run, that's certainly going to be helpful to McDonald's as an organization. Now, as you mentioned, you know, historically, employers have not seen continuing the education as an option. I mean, they, they, they've seen it as an option, I should say, but yeah. they've not seen it as a requirement. Was there a watershed moment, an aha moment for employers where they said, 
hey, things are beginning to change over the past 10 years, 20 years, perhaps even 30 years. What was happening? Well, look, I, I think we're in the middle of seeing and feeling that right now. And there have been a few major drivers of that. You know, one has been for a while now, a white hot talent market, right? You know, just uh, so many leaders who are saying, you know, my only limitation to growth is, you know, people to, to fill the jobs that I need for that growth. And so I think, you know, employers have, have realized, and this has been, you know, for a while now, that that's the case. You know, we sit in, you know, the United States right now where, you know, we don't, we don't really have any net population growth to speak of. Uh, you know, immigration has not been a big driver of new talent into the country. We have a population age demographic that's aging out of the workplace with baby boomers. And we're in a trough, a corresponding trough, interestingly enough, of 18 to 24 year olds, where for the next five years, for example, uh, we have fewer 18 year olds coming into, you know, college age. Um, and so, you know, there's just there's not there's not enough people out there. Right. So so I think white hot talent market some population demographics at play here, the realization that a lot of roles are just changing dramatically because of changing technology and you know, other things. So even if you have workers available, they still have to be you know, trained and educated along the way. Um, and then I think you have major factors like a pandemic happening, right? And it kind of put a lot of people in a situation where they reevaluated what they're doing with their lives, what they're doing with their work hey, it's nice to work from home if I'm able to do that. And why do I have to go back to the office? And so, you know, that, so I think there's been a couple of major drivers of that. But we are, I really believe we are in the middle of seeing that transformation of it going from what you said, optional that employers invest in this to a requirement. And the ones who are really doing a world-class job on this, you're seeing it in their results, right? They're, they are able to fill the roles they're looking to fill. They are retaining people um, and, and, you know, that is a huge competitive advantage. Is there a benefit for employers to create better relationships with educational institutions, or is it better for those employers to keep, to create their own edu educational opportunities in house? Yeah. So we're seeing both, right? I mean, it's interesting there are, and I'm in the middle of a lot of these in my work at Kaplan, right? Helping universities build partnerships with employers and employers identify education and training and other, you know, partnerships that, that involve universities, right? And one thing that's interesting is that both of these parties have, have largely not been very good at building these relationships. Now, don't get me wrong. There, there are, you know, universities that have always had great capabilities and long-standing employer partnerships and companies that have had this with universities, but, you know, they're fewer and further between in terms of the really great kind of best practice examples. You know, your average college or university, your average employer, they don't, they don't really know how to build these types of relationships. They don't have people who are dedicated, you know, to nurturing those relationships. And so there's still plenty of room for opportunity out there, but you're seeing a mix of stuff, right? Go back to the Google IT certifications that have become wildly popular um, and leading to, you know, in-demand, high-paying jobs. That was all developed by Google, right? Google also has a number of university partnerships, but those Google IT certs were developed by Google. And, you know, it's an interesting point. And, you know, Google, when they launched those, came out, and in addition to launching those, those offerings, they also said, hey, we're going to treat the people who get a Google IT cert as equivalent to a college degree in our own hiring process, that was another, you know, layer to it. And so, you know, you're seeing a mix of employers going out and doing it on their own. Uh, even the ones who are doing some things on their own, they are continuing to build ecosystem partnerships with community colleges, four-year colleges and universities. Um, but we're still at the very, very beginning of this. One of the things that's been interesting about education benefits as a movement is that fundamentally what's happening is it's actually one of the examples and one of the few examples of where the cost of college is actually going down mm -hmm. because what's happening with some of these large employers that are bringing universities into the mix of their education benefits program is they're, they're essentially negotiating uh, volume discounts on tuition. And because they're sending, you know, hundreds and in some, in some cases, thousands of employees into these institutions, they're able to negotiate with those universities uh, better tuition rates. And, and ultimately, 
that lowers the cost of college, right? It lowers the cost of college for uh, those individuals participating. And, and I think it opens up some really exciting examples of where this goes. So let me, let me just give you one of them. There was an article in Inside Higher Education, one of the industry higher ed trade pubs, about three weeks ago about the growing number of traditional age students who are enrolling in fully online universities, right? So for fully online degrees. And back to where we started this conversation, right? We've, we've mostly thought of online degrees as for adult learners because of course it's flexible. It's in many cases more affordable. In some cases, it's the only option that they have to get a college degree because they can't, they can't go to the ground university option or there isn't one close or whatever it is, right? So we've thought about online education as for these adult you know, working learners. And what's interesting is the fastest growing demographic enrolling in these online universities are 18 to 24 year olds. So Howard, I think that is a huge point, right? Because you know, you've, got, you've got young people who are saying, well, you know, there's traditional college as an option, there's residential experience, et cetera. I'm, I'm gonna go a different route here. And they're going that different route for a number of reasons. It's flexible, it's affordable. They can live at home and save some money while they're doing it. Uh, they might be able to work while they're going to college, right? So they can kind of have their cake and eat it too from that perspective. So that's a really interesting trend to watch. I think you're going to see much more of that where you will still have families and students that value the traditional residential college experience, but more and more the numbers are going, you know, uh, they're, they're declining in terms of interest in that traditional college experience and they're on the rise pretty dramatically and the percentage of 18 to 24 year olds are saying, you know what, I'm going to take this online degree option. I'm going to work while I'm doing it. And, uh, and I think that is going to be a trend that's going to be a noticeable difference in how people do college in America. I do want to talk a little bit more about online education in a bit, but I, I want to go back to something. Uh, when we talk about the partnerships, and I want to throw something out to you that that I experienced recently, and you can tell me whether or not I'm, I'm on track here. I was at an event at a, a DC area community college, and there was a financial institution, an invest, a large investment firm that had an office at the community college. And they had a staff member from that financial institution permanently in place to teach, for example, uh, financial literacy and management for the students of all ages, but also for the college employees. Is that the kind of partnership that you're talking about when you're when you're getting an education outside of the job, but it, it's right there and, and and available. I thought that was I thought it was innovative. Yeah, no, that that's that's a super example of some of the innovation that's going on out there. And you know, it, it's it's happening in many different permutations of that, right? So you know, think about the very, very long-standing example of primarily lots of, uh, you know, banking, financial services institutions who, you know, have had for a hundred years now employees volunteering for junior achievement to teach financial literacy in uh, primarily Title I public schools, right? So, you know, that that's a that's an example of something that's been going for a long time. What you're talking about is, I, you know, I think, a, you know, a new iteration of that theme you know, which is getting employees from the firm engaged, you know, physically present on the campus. Um, and, you know, it, it, it kind of changes how you think about college recruiting too, right? You know, you're, you're there, you're providing a service, you're a valuable part of the ecosystem, especially if you're an employer that has a major regional hub really close to that, you know, college or, or university, there's a lot of value in those kinds of partnerships to build those bridges and to kind of you know, have an influence on on that talent in a way where it's not just, hey, come work for me, but they're providing some valuable, uh, you know, training and education as part of that. So we're certainly seeing a lot of cool examples like that. Um, increasingly seeing examples of, of employers who are thinking about very non-traditional recruiting pathways. And, you know, for the most part, a lot of big name employers didn't really actively recruit at community colleges. You're seeing more of an effort there, right? And 
um, announcements from some of the elite firms that used to only do on-campus interviews at, say, an Ivy League institution who have now switched to doing video-based interviews because they've realized they can open up to talent uh, at, at hundreds of schools as opposed to just, you know, the, the, the trips they made, uh, you know, in person to, you know, a handful of Ivy League institutions. So there's a lot of changes in how people are thinking about recruitment, how they're thinking about talent development. And ultimately, I think it's an example of this, you know, value forward proposition that I see happening a lot. You know, I'm going to I'm going to give you something valuable. I'm going to teach you something valuable. And that's a way to attract you to this organization before you've even thought about whether I you know, might might be interested in working there. You know, we we talk a lot about the the worker and enhancing their education. But I think the bottom line for a lot of workers is that particularly in uncertain economic times, is that they don't want to just keep a job, but they do want to be happy. They want to be satisfied. Yeah. Do you think that these kinds of, of educational partnerships and emphasis on education for, for adult workers uh, is designed with a goal to keeping those adult workers happy? Yeah, well, that's part of it. So I, you know, went back to some of the, you know, the data I mentioned before, right? One of the top uh, factors for why people are choosing jobs right now is is learning growth and development opportunities in those roles. I mean, it's risen to the very top of priorities up there with a the benefits package and pay and all that kind of stuff there. So that's clearly the will of the modern day worker, if, you know, if, if you can kind of think about it that way. And, you know, whether we use the word happy or satisfied or engaged, you know, some researchers will, you know, will, will quibble with the nuances between those. But but to your you know, general point, it's not just about a job and it's not just about the pay. It is very much about a lot of those really important and kind of more intangible factors of is it a, is it a high quality job? Am I in a job where I feel engaged? You know, that that's driven by my manager and whether he or she cares about my development. Right. And and it's driven by do I feel connected to the mission and purpose of the organization? There's a lot of great Gallup research out there that that speaks to this. And what's interesting, you know, I'll give you a stat about this point about, you know, there's there's jobs and there's great jobs and there's a big difference between the two. Uh, you know, in, in many cases, you would say any job is better than no job at all. But that's not always true because there's actually research that says workers who are highly disengaged in their job are worse off in, in, in certain dimensions of their well-being than people who are unemployed. And that, you know, that's hard to imagine, but like a really bad job and somebody who's disgruntled at, at work and in their job, that can be a really unhealthy thing. So it's not always true that any job is better than no job at all, uh, but there's a huge difference between a job and a great job. And, and, and Gallup has, has quantified this from their WorldPoll research and uh, Gallup's new CEO, John Clifton, just came out with a book called Blind Spot that I encourage folks to read. And in it, you know, he quantifies how many people in the world want a good job, but don't have one. And good job is defined by, you know, family sustaining wages. It's defined by, you know, they're engaged in their work. Right. So there's multiple dimensions to it. But but here's the global data. Right. There are three point three billion people on the planet who want a great job and don't have one. Ultimately, there are three hundred million people who have a great job across the globe. So think about that for a second, right? Like the, the, I think the great challenge of leaders for the next several decades to come is going to be not simply thinking about providing you know, employment. It's going to be how do I create as many jobs as possible and create an environment where people are in great jobs, where they're really engaged in their work. That is ultimately going to be, be the measure. Right now, we measure the percentage of people who are unemployed. Why aren't we measuring the percentage of people who have great jobs. You can measure this kind of stuff. We ought to be measuring it at a global level, a country level, but certainly can do it at an organizational level. But there's our there's our global track record. 3.3 billion people want a great job. There's only 300 million who have one. We're talking to Brandon Bastide. He is the Chief Partnership Officer and Global Head of Learn, Work, Innovation at Kaplan North America. We're discussing the future of adult education and its relationship to job seekers. Now, Brandon, as you know, 
during the height of the pandemic, colleges and universities were forced to, to shut down and to pivot to online learning. And in some cases, they were caught flat-footed. <laughs> Can it be argued that adult learning institutions were already ahead of the curve when it comes to online learning? Oh, there's no doubt about that, right? I mean, they're, you know, they're, I mean, you know, Kaplan was in online adult education starting in 2000, right? So a good 20 years of that leading up to the pandemic. And of course, there were several other major institutions that were heavily invested in online education, both traditional and non-traditional ones, for at least a couple decades, right, pre-pandemic. That said, it was, it, it was growing numbers of students before the pandemic going into online programs. So the you know, major players like Southern New Hampshire University and Western Governors University and University of Maryland Global Campus and Purdue Global, right? Like they were, they were growing in terms of enrollments pre-pandemic. Um, and, and now, you know, a really interesting thing has happened that those, those institutions are actually the largest you know, specifically Southern New Hampshire and Western Governors University, they're the largest institutions in the United States. Both of them are less than 25 years old. There will be, by the end of next year, based on their trajectory, there will be more people who are graduates of Western Governors University than the Ohio State University, which has been around for 150 plus years, right? And so, you know, you just, and, and is one of the largest universities in the country, right? So just step back and think about that. In just 25 years, an online, primarily adult serving university has now produced more graduates than an institution like The Ohio State. And so, you know, clearly there's an accelerated interest in online degree programs. But to me, the most fascinating thing that happened was an article I wrote about in Forbes earlier this year, a new study came out there had been a number of surveys that, that were tracking people's perceptions of the quality of an online education. And this won't be a surprise to anybody, you know, when, when a lot of this tracking started, you know, roughly 10 years ago, uh, the percentage of people who, who thought of an online degree as a high quality degree was pretty low. If you surveyed, you know, managers or hiring managers, you know, asked about the quality of an online education, low percentages who who said yeah it's a quality degree then when you started to ask people questions like hey you know is online education on par with in person education most people were like no here's the fascinating thing the latest data this past year americans are now rating online education as equivalent to the quality of in person education and so that is a a fascinating and in some cases kind of mind blowing statistic there are still folks that are going to prefer in-person education, so don't misunderstand that. But the majority of Americans now see online education as on par with the quality of in-person education. And you're increasingly seeing employers, this is a fascinating thing, who are actually preferring to hire working adults who got their degrees online because they're like, you did that? You got two kids, you were working full time, and you did your bachelor's degree? Come on board, right? Like, that's a really, really big accomplishment. So they might not have the, the prestige of a, you know, a top ranked university diploma sitting on their wall, but they have the hard earned respect of like, hey, I got my bachelor's degree while I was doing this thing called life and work and family. And so it's now become something that employers are, are looking for as a preference, not something that they're like, what, you got your degree from where, you know, tell me about that. So I think those are all really, really important trends that that tell us that, you know, the future of online education is is certainly bright. Uh, we've gotten to a place where the quality of the experience, not in all cases, right, because there's still examples of really crappy online courses out there. Right. Just like there are examples of crappy in-person courses out there, to be <laughs> frank. That, that's um, AP basket weaving. Though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, well, look, we, we all know we've had teachers that were amazing. We've had some teachers that were duds. Like we've all been there, right? And then and we've taken courses that were phenomenal and super engaging. And others were like, oh my God, this is a waste of my time. So, you know, so to think that there's some in-person education, right? Like to, to assume that all in-person education is great. That's not the right assumption. To assume all online education, you know, is terrible. That's obviously not the right assumption. To your point, though, in the early days of the pandemic, a lot of people's experiences and that kind of crash course to Zoom classes and things like that, it wasn't the greatest experience. But very quickly, 
people started to get better at it. Interestingly, faculty and teachers started to learn how to, you know, utilize the medium and make it really useful. And they got very creative and familiar with it very quickly. You know, these are smart, talented people. They might not have ever taught online before, but give them a few months of it and they start to really figure it out. Well, now we're coming out of this and we've got faculty and teachers that want to keep teaching online or enjoy, you know, having a couple days at home uh, as opposed to being on campus or in the classroom. So, you know, we're, we're in the middle of um, we, we will not come back on this hybridity point, right? Like, you know, even return to work. I mean, you know, there's a couple examples of places that are like, we want everybody back. But for the most part, hybridity is here to stay. Uh, hybridity is here to stay in the workplace. And it's definitely here to stay in the educational uh, setting as well. And that's, I think, the piece that, that you are really getting at about innovations in online learning, particularly since the pandemic has essentially changed so much yeah. about our day-to-day -day living, our day-to-day -day working, our day-to-day -day, uh, or learning. Uh, what other kinds of innovations do you believe have really stuck out for adult education uh, since the pandemic? Well, I mean, you know, in most of these cases, there were plenty of examples pre-pandemic, right? So there, there are very few things I can look at and say, well, we weren't doing that at all before the pandemic. It was usually it was happening and now it's been accelerated, right? So I think those are most of the examples that I've seen is that there were, you know, some of it was happening, pandemic happened and it accelerated, you know, some of those pieces. And so, you know, examples though, I'll say this about, you know, working adults uh, or adults that come to education later in life, right? They finished high school, went into the workplace and then are coming back uh, to it in some form. You know, it, it, th there, there's as much magic to what I call the wraparound support services for that individual as there is the actual course or content material, right? And so, you know, you think about it, right? This is where advising, the right academic advising, the right, you know, just, you know, even, even simple things like, you know, how to navigate getting a babysitter so that I can study. And, you know, someone's got a great tip for that. Or, hey, have you ever checked out care.com? Or, you know, have you, you, do you have any family members that you could rely on, right? I mean, th these are some of the really basic but important examples of what helps adult learners succeed the right financial aid advising. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. My point, though, is that the difference between them completing the program successfully and not, in many cases, is either a lack of those wraparound support and advising services, or if they're successful, it was largely driven by those kinds of support systems, right? And so, you know, yes, the course content and the subject matter expertise matters, but I think for uh, for folks that are non-traditional learners, those wraparound support services and the advising uh, may be as important or more important in some cases. And so when you, when you when you say innovation, my mind goes right away to the innovation of those wraparound support services. Certainly, there's been innovation in educational pedagogy, right? And one of the things that continues to amaze me is that you know we there's not a lot of evidence that a lecture-based format is a strong educational pedagogy, yet we continue to do lots of lecture-based teaching, right? And, and there's, there's so many other forms of education that are more efficacious than just a straight lecture, right? And so, so what has online done? It's allowed people to do smaller video-based lecture segments. So instead of a 45-minute lecture, they might break it up into smaller pieces or instead of burning the whole classroom time on the lecture, which is just, you know, the sage on the stage doing his or her thing, they're having students review a couple videos on their own time and then come and use the classroom time for real discussion or for a project-based exercise that involves teamwork and collaboration, right? And so those are little but big examples of innovation, right? Where, where online has enabled some asynchronous learning that might be better suited asynchronously. I'll even give you a, a simple example. I had a friend who um, uh, just is, is finishing medical school and she was talking about their, their Friday lectures. And she said, well, you know, about a third of the class goes and attends in person. She mm -hmm. said about a third uh, just reviews the video of the lecture 
but they review it on on two times speed because they want to speed up the you know the the lecture because he talks too long uh, you know talks too slowly whatever <laughs> and then she said another third of the class um, will pause the video rewind it replay it right they'll kind of slowly digest the lecture because there might have been some concepts that they really struggled with or that that's just how they learn better that's a really simple but powerful example. These are medical stu school students, right? Some of our best and brightest. And the way they're choosing to digest something that otherwise was done only in an in-person lecture is sprinkled out across watching the video at 2x speed, rewinding the video, doing the playback, and then the people who just love to show up in, you know, in the auditorium, right? It's just fascinating to me. You know, you've written several articles about work in higher education. And the one that I found particularly fascinating is the article you wrote last year for Inside Higher Ed with the title, If Colleges Were Rated Like Uber Drivers. I, I loved it. I would recommend anyone uh, who is working in this space or interested in this issue to, to look it up. Um, you really turn the issue of expectations on its head. Talk to us about that. Well, look, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I want to, my life has been changed by great educators, right? Great teachers that I've had at the elementary school level, high school level, and faculty had the college level. And I think a lot of people will look back in their life and look to a, in a, an outstanding teacher that changed their life, right? So I, I, I say that because there, there also is the other end of this scale, right? There's a lot of people who have like, especially at a collegiate level, this is where I was going in that article, are in faculty roles um, who, who actually aren't really interested in teaching. They're, they aren't interested in mentoring. They haven't been incentivized or hired to do that. They're expected to do research. They're expected to do publishing. And then kind of on the side, it's like, can you teach a couple classes? And, and so, you know, we, 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 we've created a culture on most college campuses. And actually, ironically, especially at the major research universities where we do put so much emphasis on world-class subject matter expertise, publication, you know, research, uh, research funding being brought into the university, that if we're honest, we really haven't invested carefully in high quality teaching, right? Or emphasizing and rewarding high quality teaching. And so, you know, higher ed, I joke, it's, it's a little tongue in cheek, right? tongue in cheek, but the, um, you know, I joke that higher ed has studied everything except itself, right? And, you know, and it's, 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 it's largely just kind of a funny way of saying that, you know, higher ed is known for doing world-class research, um, but it hasn't turned a lot of that really critical world-class research to itself in terms of how can it improve pedagogy? How can it improve the student experience? Something like mentoring we know is incredibly valuable for students, but there really aren't many examples where, where college faculty are incentivized or rewarded for doing world-class mentoring, right? And so, um, you know, so that, you know, that particular point was that, you know, we, we might want to think differently about our expectations, right? I, I value the world-class research that's being done at American college universities. It's helping cure diseases. Many of them contributed to, you know, producing a COVID vaccine in record time. I mean, really important world-changing results from our research universities. But do those same people also have to be the teachers? And what about pairing subject matter experts with world-class teachers? And this is where in the online environment, Howard, I think we've seen some unbelievable innovation that's now coming back to the traditional classroom. And here's the example. Uh, most of the best and highest rated online courses that were produced and these are true of ones that Kaplan's been involved with, but this is examples elsewhere. They have primarily involved somebody who is a world-class subject matter expert mm -hmm. partnering with a, another person or a team of people who are curriculum development and student experience design experts, right? Yes. And yes. so now you've got a team of comp comprised of different expertise. You know, I'm the one who's the guru and how to make an online class really engaging, right? I'm the world's expert in name the topic, right? Macroeconomics and whatever, right? And, and so, you know, I partner with that person and we develop something that's substantially better than if we had done it individually. I think a lot of faculty experience that partnering with instructional designers, right? To improve online courses. And then all of a sudden they're like, wait a minute, as I go back to the classroom, 
I'd love to have an instructional design buddy to help me there. And so, you know, here's a simple point. You know, if we start to think about these jobs as as multiple roles, not just, you know, the, the person who, you know, can do world class research and be a world class teacher, that's really tough to find in the same human. It's really tough to ask of the same human being. And so I think there's just some incredible opportunities to to partner and bring different types of expertise to the to the benefit of students. Yeah. And it would make it not just beneficial, but certainly interesting because whether it's a student out of high school, a student who's returning to the educational process, that adult worker, or even you know, an older worker who wants to, to enhance his or her educational uh, process, you, you still have to make it interesting, even a little bit entertaining, uh, either to, and that's the reality of it, you know, with attention spans being what they are. And to, for that adult worker to say, here's someone who is doing the same kind of work that I'm doing, perhaps even on the other side of the world, and, and making it uh, compelling, as well as accelerating and, in, and improving the, the skill set. But, you know, but with all of that said, when you look at you know the intersection of work and education and, and economic progress, what do you think are the biggest challenges to making it fit and making it work? Yeah, our our big this is a point I harp on all the time. You know, we are not doing a good job in our educational system, and I take this at a high school level and at the collegiate level of um, preparing students for work, for success in work. And this isn't just jobs in corporate America. This is all jobs, right? Whether we're talking about government jobs, nonprofits, so I, I'm thinking about all sectors of, of em employment. And um, the big critique is that these graduates are just not well prepared for success in the workplace. And if you get under the hood of the ingredients that, that do uh, increase the probability that graduates are work ready, it's a fairly simple list of stuff, Howard, right? It's not, we're, we're not talking about rocket science here. We're talking about our inability to prioritize and scale what is already pretty well known. And so, so to give you an example, you know, a graduate from college who had a job or an internship during college where they were able to apply what they were learning in the classroom doubles their odds of being engaged in their work throughout their lifetime, right? I mean, it's an unbelievable relationship. And yet only a third of college graduates in the U.S. hit the mark on that. So it's not that some, you know, that, I mean, we're doing it for a third of them, but two thirds are graduating, leaving college, having missed this precious, you know, experience where they were able to connect the dots between what they were learning in the classroom and what they did in some kind of work experience. Like, shame on us for not scaling that. And, it, and, and it's not just pointing fingers at higher ed. This is where, you know, the employers out there who are saying, hey, colleges, give me better work ready graduates. It comes all the way back and they have to look themselves in the mirror because, you know, that that really is a student who had an internship or a co-op or some other, you know, work experience while they're in college. Well, guess who has those employers? Right. And so, you know, we we really need employers to step up more in providing those kinds of work experiences. And by the way, it doesn't cut it to have an unpaid internship. This is one of the big equity imperatives that I see in our talent development pipeline. You know, because you step back and you ask yourself the question, take Washington, D.C. You and I both live in the Washington, D.C. area. It is not a cheap city to live in. Right. You think about a college student. There's all kinds of really great internship opportunities in the summer in Washington, D.C., but a lot of them are unpaid or they're really low paid. I mean, it's just finally this year, the White House started to do paid internships, which it had never done in the past. And uh, and so you say, well, who are the students that can afford to come to Washington, D.C. for the summer? and take an unpaid job? Well, I mean, we know the answer. There's students who can afford to or whose families can afford to have them do that. So, so anyway, you know, I'm harping generally on the point of employers needing to provide more internship opportunities. College and universities needing to prioritize that experience for students to say, I'm gonna give you academic credit for it. I'm gonna give you room in the academic calendar to go do that like our great co-op institutions do at places like Northeastern and Drexel, right? And then it's also pressure on the employers to say it's not just about making them available. It's an equity imperative to make sure they are paid internships so that we get the full diversity of our talent pipeline involved in these experiences. So, 
you know, that's ultimately where we're falling down. We don't have enough work integrated learning experiences in school. And on the flip side, what employers are realizing is, is they need to create more room for learning integrated work because we need to keep constantly upskilling and reskilling people. So my basic thesis, Howard, is that we are, you know, speedily heading towards a world where, you know, learning and work are going to merge and it's going to be hard to step back and, and say, hey, is this a, is this a university or is this, or is this a place of employment? Like, is this a workplace or a college? Is this a workplace or a school? Because in each of those domains, you're going to see lots of learning taking place and lots of work ex experience taking place. That's ultimately where we need to head. I only have a, a few minutes left, but I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of share some final thoughts when it comes to, you know, the the adult worker and education and economic process for uh, the worker as well as the institutions? Well, you know, I, th I think I summarized it. My wish is, is that we get to a place where, uh, I'll say it a different way. I, I mentioned a merger of learning and work, right? Where there's more work integrated learning in schools and there's more learning integration into workplaces. But I think fundamentally, one of the things we've done as a society over the last several decades is we have devalued the learning that can come from work, right? Mm -hmm. So the learning value of work. And, and so I'll give the example of very well-intentioned parents who will say to their kids, if they can afford not to work, your job is to get good grades, right? So That's I don't want right. you, I don't want you to have a job because I've your job that. I've heard that, yeah. Is to get good grades. Okay. Now look, I don't want to um discourage students from getting good grades, okay? But I'm not gonna put all of the importance on grades alone. I want them to work. I want them to have some kind of work experience. And I wanna make sure they understand the learning value of that work, right? Not just the paycheck that comes from it, right? I, I was a cashier at Ponderosa Steakhouse. It wasn't hard. It wasn't hard to learn the cash register. Once you learn that, it was a kind of boring task. But if you step back and said, well, what if I observe the manager of this Ponderosa, right? Does he or she motivate the employees? If so, what kind of employees are more or less motivated by that person's leadership style? Have I observed any ethical dilemmas that have cropped up in the workplace, like the chef drinking all the chocolate milk in the fridge and not paying for it, right? Like, you know, how does, a, how does somebody disarm a disgruntled customer, right? How do they handle that situation? My point is every job, we can learn things from. And every day in a job, we can learn things from. I think we've lost track of the learning value of work and it's resulted in today's 18 to 24 year olds being the least working generation in US history. We can't afford to have that happen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Brandon Bustied, I, I think we're gonna have to have that be uh, the last word, uh, but I really appreciate your insight and your expertise. Again, Brandon Busty, Chief Partnership Officer and Global Head of Learn Work Innovation for Kaplan North America. We also want to thank the Aries Management Corporation for its sponsorship and enthusiastic participation in today's event. I'm Harold Fisher. Thank you so much for your interest. <laughs>